Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 683. That is 683 of the Agostino Zynga show. I hope this podcast is finding you well, wherever you may be. I hope this podcast is finding you well. How am I? All good, all things considered. I cannot lie. All good, all all things considered. I've had a good pump in the gym. I'm feeling fit and healthy. My limbs are very, very loose. I've been keeping myself extremely hydrated, especially during these summer months here in flipping London, where for the most part, no one, no one, no building, no person has any flipping AC. So you're baking literally everywhere you go. And now I'm at the point where I'm thinking, are we too far into the spring, heading into the summer where you can't exactly go and get flipping an air conditioning unit because you probably won't use it too often? Or should I go do it anyway? I know I flipping flaked on doing it last year. I was speaking about getting a fan. I did flip and follow through. But this year might have to be the case because living in an apartment with carpeted floors, <laughs> that's clearly an apartment that's been built, you know, re fairly recently. And then having the flipping heat just be trapped inside here which is nice during the winter months because it means you don't need to flip and turn on the heating or anything but during the summer months oh it is baking in here absolutely baking and sometimes when i'm recording and i've got my little led flipping light on here um you know and i'm <laughs> i've got the doors closed and stuff i feel like i'm in a fucking you know in some gay bathhouse somewhere it gets really really crazy really really quickly um but hey we we proceed we maintain we don't cry we're not victims we don't start you know we don't hold up placards down the street bemoaning our poor luck we just keep on going we just keep on going well anyway i've been good i've been fine everything's been going great there's been some really good news happening actually on the interwebs that i want to speak to you guys about so obviously we're going to do that um the best news to come out of this kind of last couple of days has been the clear indication that qatar is definitely in the lead to buy man united there was this real brief period where a lot of us were getting worried, myself included, and I was getting really afraid of my flipping mental health, <laughs> that I was going to have to main, you know, endure another 10 plus years of partial Glazer ownership if flipping Sir Jim Ratcliffe ended up um, being successful in his bid for partial ownership of the club. But now it's looking like Qatar's, you know, take it or leave it, $6 billion um, deal or offer has now been seriously considered by the Glazers and they're considering accepting it. So they look at the front runners. And this is news courtesy of Reuters that says as, as follows as well. Exclusive. May United negotiate an exclusivity um, with Qatar's Sheikh Jassim in 6 billion plus sale talks. It should be exclusively, right? Or exclusive, it doesn't matter. Um, so clearly Sheikh Jassim is in a lead. I'm over the moon. I don't really care who it is. I think I'm not really, I don't know, maybe the Qatar ownership has a different sort of tint to it. People kind of see what's been happening with other Middle East, Middle Eastern owners and again, a bit excited, but I've never really been bothered about who the profile of the person is. My main prerogative has always been whoever comes and puts in an offer for my and I want him to put an offer for the entire thing. No partial, no nothing. Full ownership and kick the Glazers out ASAP. Get rid of every single banker, crony, rubbish flipping nonsense you know um paper shuffler that was in the building that they hired and start all again from scratch i don't care if that means we have to finish six for flipping two seasons in a row i want us to actually put together a coherent and a very kind of you know detail oriented sporting project and then kind of fill in the gaps as need be you know across the uh, you know during time that we kind of go on that's basically my main prerogative i didn't really care about who it was but if it's the qataris and they're offering the full amount and they want to take the glazers out then i'm all for it to be honest i'm all flipping for it it continues that english football club man united is negotiating granting exclusivity to the consortium led by qatar sheikh jassim bin hamad al tahini in talks to sell itself for more than six billion dollars people familiar with the matter have said on thursday while the deal remains uncertain the development represents a major milestone in the efforts of sheikh jassim the son of qatar's former prime minister who is one of the richest men in the gulf state to take over the iconic sports brand members of the glazer family who own minority stakes in man united and control 
bullet thanks to the dual class share structure would be cashing out as part of the proposed deal one source said the Qatar offer is currently being viewed by the Glazers as more favorable than a bid from British billionaire Jim Ratcliffe founder of chemicals producer Ionos and sources I did Ratcliffe's offer envisions that the Glazers would keep some interest in Man United Man interest in United would not be allowed to negotiate with any bidder other than Sheikh Jassim for exclusivity period it could not be learned how long this period may last the sources caution the situation remained fluid and new bidder Ratcliffe could prevent Sheikh Jassim from securing the exclusivity so it's unlikely because you know from what I've been reading Ratcliffe had to raise quite a lot of money just for the partial ownership offer or bid sorry so it would be really um surprising if Ratcliffe is able to kind of turn around and say hey I've got more money for full control of the club that'd be really interesting but it could happen um I've also been led to believe that the process is going to take anywhere between I think like someone said that eight to twelve weeks so it's going to probably lead into or bleed into next season which is really annoying which means that the transfer window's all but kind of null and void for us now going forward you would imagine if you're the Glazers do you really want to spend even if it's not your money do you want to spend any money between now and the sale um if you're going to sell you know within flipping the next couple of months or so it doesn't really make any sense but obviously for us as a club it's going to mean that we're going to be um starting the season off with basically the same squad that we ended um this season with or that's just gone which is kind of upsetting but again if it means that we start again from scratch and we actually have a coherent sporting project and we actually have you know um accountability at the club for once in terms of a sporting club especially of a football club then i'm all for it it continues Sources requested anonymity because the matter is confidential. Representative May United and Sheikh Jassim did not immediately respond. Shares of May United jumped as much as 15% on the news and ended trading in New York City Thursday at 6.8% with $24.81. A $6 billion plus deal for May United would be one of the biggest ever in the sports world following a similar size sale for National Football League's Washington Comrades um, Commander sorry, earlier this year. It would also be represent a significant premium to other soccer deals last year the 3.1 billion acquisition of Chelsea Football Club by an investment group led by Todd Bowley and Clear Lake Capital valued it at 5.7 times revenue for its last financial year. A sale for more than 6 billion would also value May United at more than 10 times last year's annual revenue according to the Refinite data. The Glazer family which made its fortune in real estate and healthcare and retail also owns NFL's Tampa Bay Buccaneers bought the team for 790 million pounds 1 billion in 2005 so it's a big come up for them to be honest um record 20 time in the championship champions may united have over 600 million fans worldwide according to a market research firm Cantor, and a large number of them have been clamoring for a change of ownership um, that is because the Glazers have overseen a significant downturn of club's fortunes, with the club winning just the last of their 20 top flight titles in the former Manchester Ferguson's Ferguson final season in charge in 2012-13. Jesus Christ, it's been a long time. But yeah, we need it more than ever, especially now with the competition in the league, um, especially now with the competition in Europe. We just need an ownership that gets it that wants us to actually win trophies that isn't preoccupied more so with us finishing fourth and whatnot and then when we finish fourth doesn't give the managers funds to kind of push from then on we don't need that we don't need um you know owners who are going to see players contracts as a way to kind of you know players contract renewal sorry as a way to kind of add value to the club this is a really strange glazer on glazer and on economics that they do right um where they essentially um will give a player sometimes that isn't even playing well who isn't even getting game time a contract extension just because they feel like it's going to add value to them and it's going to increase the possibility for the Blazers to sell that player for more than maybe they purchased or to kind of get the money back I don't know what it is but regardless it means that we end up hemorrhaging players we end up having an overinflated, um you know um ill-balanced squad overall and it just really dampens our opportunity to kind of go out and get new players and new talent in to fresh up the squad and whatnot so all that stuff is usually really concerning for me but this is really good news I'm hoping um, whoever does purchase the club I don't really care who it is between the both of Ratcliffe and um, what you call it Sheikh Jassim even though Ratcliffe kind of you know did snake us by saying he's a United fan and then being happy to do a deal where he'd give the Glazers partial ownership it's fair to say that he's clearly not a United fan that kind of has United best interest at heart because if best interest was at heart there's no way you would accept that sort of deal but that aside if he comes back on the table and says hey 
okay, I got the money. I can blow these guys out of the water. I'm going to give you seven or eight or 10 billion, then fair, whatever. But I just want someone to come in who actually has a plan for the club going forward, a sporting project, not something, you know, concerned overly with money and top four finishes and whatnot. No, something that involves us winning trophies, um, challenging for the league, challenging for domestic cups and all that good stuff and European trophies, of course. That's what I want to see. And I'm hoping we see that very, very soon. But definitely good news on the Manchester United front. Definitely good news on the Manchester United front. Um, next on the list here. Um, let's see. I'm actually want to read this because I want to know what's happening here because something happened really strange over at Flipping Bergheim over the weekend. And I want to see what the vibe is because for some reason, there is a real hesitancy for people to speak openly and clearly about issues, especially when they happen in Bergheim. I don't know why it is because the club's big enough and there's way, you know, there's a lot of people, turnover is flipping crazy. The amount of people that go through those doors on a weekend basis. It's very unlikely that if you speak ill about the club that people are going to recognize you and don't say, ah, you're the person that's not going to come in. It's really unlikely. If they do, it's Berlin anyway. You know, there's flipping clubs every on flipping every street corner you can go to if you do end up kind of getting put on the flipping blacklist or something of Berg of Bergheim for speaking ill. But sometimes the reason why I find it strange is because usually the people that are afraid of speaking ill of the club are people who maybe suffered, you know, a, a very traumatic experience being there whether it was an argument in the queue whether it was a fight whether it was somebody you know assaulting them raping them spiking them whatever it may be it's something really heinous that you'd think you know the person would have every reason to complain and to want to speak about it to somebody right you'd think that will be the case but for some reason for whatever reason people don't seem to feel like that so i guess you know for whatever reason um you have to kind of read these things out somewhat anonymously and just hope that you know it resonates with some people but i remember reading when i was on the sub the other day that some people were talking about oh there was an issue with police at the front of Burger and stuff and things were happening bloody blah 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 so let's actually see the thread here and i can see what they're talking about so this is a thread that someone posted I'm not going to read their username or anything I'm just going to read the post itself and see what the vibe is saying it says i've been struggling with whether or not to share what i experienced on sunday morning i'm still processing it and traumatized by what i experienced i currently cannot type oh you did type a few a bit my person whoever this person is you typed a lot because there's like 17 million paragraphs here so you're not really struggling to type but hey we move <laughs> let's continue here let's scroll back up at the top i'm sure my laughing will definitely be <laughs> seen as a good thing later on but let's continue um i'm sure i won't regret that let's see i'm still processing it and traumatized by what i experienced i currently cannot type because my left hand is injured as a result of what happened on sunday therefore i've given permission to my partner for him to type what i'm saying aloud word for word i apologize for my thoughts sound scattered as i still have um still feel all over the place about th these days cool i've read some of the comments on various threads about what happened on sunday morning and some of the details are inaccurate therefore i decided to share what happened my partner and i were at an event near Berghain and on the way home we passed by we had no interest in going clubbing that evening as we were both pretty exhausted from an event we were at all day i've already been to Bergheim before in the past several years ago and i've nothing negative to say about the actual club inside so please don't assume that i have an anger towards the club in or itself because i was tired i wanted to take a break and we thought it might be interesting to see people's outfits and the overall vibe and maybe share a cigarette we weren't planning on staying long we were sitting on the concrete block that is across from the guest list yeah, everyone does that really. It's a little block bit. It's next to, there's a cash point there also. People like stand there, eat. Like if you pass that area, you know what the person's talking about. Usually there's loads of flipping drinks on the floor. People drink their last bits of drinks there. They've got some food there, pizza, whatever. There's a cash machine there and just up the road or just, you know, down the alleyway. Sorry, that's where the little park is where you can sit down in and have a joint. So that's usually a place where people congregate. The Bergheim staff do a good job of like keeping the doorway clear. They don't like people taking pictures right in front of the door or near the door so you don't show people's faces. They keep the area clear in front of where the, the door area is. But usually where that concrete slab is, which is next to where that installation of that piece of art, that's like an upside down A, like the anarchist A, that's usually on that side. So it shouldn't be an issue really. So it's a bit strange if this was a problem. So it continues. We're sitting across, we're sitting on the concrete block that is across from the guest list. We have done that several times before in the past, sitting there and have never experienced anything before like what we experienced on Sunday. Therefore, we assumed it was okay. We noticed there was a lot of people around us doing the same thing. They were not necessarily close to us, but they were around. At some point, two men came up to my partner and I and started screaming at us, telling us we had to leave. Their tone was very aggressive and like they wanted to start a fight. The man screaming at me was tall and slender and light-skinned by 
biopic bipoc what's that mean oh yeah that's like um what is that actually black and indian person of color or something what the fuck is that what's a bipoc oh yeah, i'm so ignorant of this shit what's a fucking bipoc bipoc stands for black indigenous person of color so what why do why would you say bipoc and just just calling them like so i guess this person didn't know if they were black or indian okay i'm just gonna keep reading um the, the man screaming at my partner was white short and middle-aged i told them that we were just sharing a cigarette and that we would leave soon i explained to them that we had no interest going into the club at all he told me again that i should leave and then he grabbed me on both sides of my shoulders in a very tight grip yo imagine you just you're just coming down from going on a night out you're tired you're a bit delirious and you just want to sit down and have a cigarette with your partner and then suddenly now you've got these guys screaming at you, one of them touching you and trying to physically move you from where you are. Like, God almighty, what an absolute nightmare. This is definitely a vibe killer. Um, I spent to my own interest in going to a club. He told me again that I should leave and grab me on both sides of my shoulders in a very tight grip that was painful and shocked me because of how forceful it was. I told him to stop touching me, but he kept on being aggressive. I asked him, why are you doing this to us? They aggressively kept pushing us and my partner and I told them we were going to call the police because I didn't know why they were being so aggressive. At this point, I was totally in a state of shock and if everything felt like that it was moving so fast, it was terrifying. All I remember was when I was leaving, um, when I had my back turned, I was pushed. Whoa. So who was who did this? Was this a security guard at Bergheim? Like who was doing this? The bouncers or just random people that wanted a seat or something? Like what was going on? So I turned around. I was pushed. I remember flying in the air, moving towards a concrete block in rapid motion. I shouldn't be laughing, but that is fucking crazy. Imagine coming down, wanting to have a cigarette, just chill. And now suddenly your face is fucking... In, you're flying through the air and your face is about to fucking crash into a fucking concrete slab that you were just sitting on um, i remember thinking that i was going to die my head was towards the concrete the ground beneath me was all even stones uneven stones like a broken chessboard then there was a wired fence above the concrete stones but all i saw was my head going towards the concrete <laughs> next thing i know i'm on the ground all i feel is pain and shock though i would be dead um i thought i would be dead and i was but and i was still alive but my hand was um was killing me it's like that song what's that thing um i'm still alive i'm still alive let's see if i can find it actually do you, do you remember that song of that rapper that when he got shot by his ops but then he obviously you know was alive was it was it still alive still alive rap song let's see i'm still alive I'm still alive. 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 Anyway, uh, <laughs> I didn't know what happened. I felt like I couldn't breathe. It was hell. I looked down at my hand and was horrified. I couldn't recognize my hand. Oh my god had broken at first i thought i was a finger was missing and then i realized my pinky finger was making a shape i didn't know was humanly possible it sent me into a state of shock my partner told me later on that i couldn't stop crying and screaming my partner kept telling everybody around us to call the police or ambulance he kept telling people and waiting nothing was happening once my partner felt calm enough he called the police himself if your partner is there honestly i would i'm catching a murder case i'm not even i'm not even a violent type of dude but if i'm with somebody and this shit happens. I'm catching a murder case. Like, it just is what it is. We wait for people to call the police. What? It took a while for the police to arrive. They asked me some questions. I told them exactly what happened. And then later the ambulance came and took me to the nearest hospital. Next five hours were nerve wracking, humiliating and scary. I had no idea what happened to my hand. I had no idea um, if I'd be able to use my finger again. I had a hard time walking. Even today, it's hard for me to straighten out my right knee. I have injuries on both knees and injury on my left elbow, pain around my eye and left side of my forehead and the left side of my head in general i have an all i have an almost harry potter like scar on the side of my head i don't have health insurance in germany so the doctors didn't have um didn't want to do all the test they mainly focused on my hand they took some x-rays and they said my pinky finger is dislocated oh my god imagine like i said again you're having a cigarette on the come down you want the people watching just chill maybe grab a quick drink have a little chat or something whatever it may be and now suddenly your fucking pinky finger is dislocated they said I would have to do more x-rays before the week in case to check if nothing is broken and that everything is okay. 
they but they buddy wrapped my pinky finger and my ring finger and also they wrapped my hand and my wrist it looks like a temporary cast to stabilize my injuries for the past few days my partner has had to help me shower take to me to the toilet eat and walk i couldn't walk at all for the first day i had to stay in bed all day our sleep has been really bad i feel okay sometimes and then sometimes thoughts just overwhelm me and i feel anxious and scared for the first few days i couldn't stop crying at times i just felt suicidal jesus i feel trapped in my body i can't move freely now and every time i look at my cast my hand and my wrist is to remember a reminder sorry of what happened to me i feel helpless i'm trying to navigate all this in a country that is not my own with systems that i don't understand and it's daunting i don't know where to find an educated speaking therapist i don't know if i'll navigate things without insurance i don't know if the authorities will even help me i hopefully this this post is a good um is a good sort of like a call to action to some people who also do want to help out who can help out to get in touch with this person i hope that does happen i'm sure it has happened because you know that berlin community type people you know they can be a little bit insufferable but they do rally around people when they need so i'm sure they're going to do that um it continues to say i can't stop thinking that i could have died the fact that i'm alive ultimately comes down to centimeters i keep telling my partner that it could have been so much worse it keeps me up at night i can't get the image out of my head of how my finger looked as if i have some kind of horror movie only that this is my life i don't know if i'll ever get the image out of my head even though even thinking about it still makes me want to vomit and gives me anxiety attacks you know what though to be fair to this person and to be fair to the situation with some kind of level of seriousness the burger and definitely need to address these issues that happen in the queue or outside whether it's kind of manhandling people whatever it may be right checking people out if they're if they're if they look like they maybe have od'd on ghb or something and then they end up in you know dire straits outside somewhere because they're not safe whatever what the situation is they need to sort it out because this could get really dicey dicey as brendan Shaw would say very quickly all it takes is one person you know having a very what you would say um permanent sort of like end post leaving burkhan or outside of burkhan and suddenly the whole landscape of clubbing in that city changes maybe the licensing around burkhan like things could happen so quickly you know to negatively affect that club if they don't kind of get these kind of things in check because i still don't know who did this don't know we don't know if this a, if it was a bouncers if it was just some random people in the flipping guess this queue that man handled these people we have no idea but they really need to get a grip on these type of things because this could end up negatively affecting not only them but the wider kind of clubbing scene community industry whatever it may be out there in berlin so jesus i've been thinking a lot of whether or not i should share this story i'm a very private person i tend to go inwards and when i'm dealing with trauma but i feel i need to share this because the thought of something like this happening to anybody else is horrifying to me at first all my natural reaction was to blame myself was it my fault and then i thought about all the ways that society gaslights people i wasn't taking any pictures or videos i wasn't drinking i wasn't doing any drugs i wasn't selling anything i wasn't talking to anybody on the line i didn't cut anybody in the line i had no interest in going to the club that day all i did was sit on a concrete block that i've sat on before and took a break and shared a cigarette it was a normal day but everything about the situation feels abnormal yeah that is so fucking unfair in it legitimately so unfair you're legitimately minding your business like one of the things you would they kind of tell you about places like Berkhan and clubs in general in berlin is that you know it's the best place to go to mind your business you don't get bothered usually because they kind of screen all the cunts and the wankers away at the door through the door picking right door picking has its issues has its problems but for the most part it allows them to sort of curate the space inside and the ones that do get in if you, if you are a dickhead you're so chuffed that you got in you usually on your best behavior so for the most part you can go into those kind of places and you know if you mind your business people usually just leave you alone so imagine being outside and thinking the same thing you know could rub off from the inside on the outside and then suddenly you end up in this physical altercation because that's the thing that's really weird about this it. like i've never even seen people argue on a berlin dance floor before let alone fighting let alone pushing somebody behind their back as they're walking away like i've not even seen people argue like exchange like you know adult fucking words to each other like it's never happened so this is crazy it continues last few bits here 
I told my family, I haven't told my family, sorry, or most of my friends about this because I still can't believe it. And I don't even know how to begin talking about this or dealing with it. I'm re I feel very isolated and alone. In my opinion, there's no justification for violence or force. There's no reason why the first reaction of security staff should be to grab my shoulders and squeeze me like they want to crush you. There's no reason to kick somebody when they're already on their way out or already on the ground, when they are not even facing you, when they have no knowledge of what you are about to do and treat you like a piece of trash. They didn't even check if I was okay. None of the stuff at Burger and check if I was okay. I could have died and no one would have cared. I still have a lot on my mind that's coming and going. I'm exhausted. I'm enraged. I'm so freaking out how to handle this. And I feel like I didn't share this. It was going to eat me up inside. I'm still really scared about this being so open. I know the Burger is a very powerful institution and it isn't easy for me yo imagine a nightclub scaring you to into not sharing a story where they fucking physically assaulted you absolutely crazy i still can't understand why they had such a re reaction to to this person i'm assuming it's a woman sitting on the concrete block i don't get that that's the thing i don't understand that concrete block like i said before is somewhere that everybody kind of sits down at um it's usually a place you kind of go, like I said, to kind of, you know, eat your food. Um, maybe that you picked up at the flipping shops around the corner or maybe you got something delivered to you or something, whatever it may be, finish a drink because you're far away from the door. You're like, I don't know, 50 meters or something away from the door. Um, and they usually leave you alone, the Bergheim staff, if they see you there. Maybe they didn't like it because there was too much of a group of people sitting on the block, standing around the guest list queue. Maybe that was a reason, but still, if that's the reason, talk to somebody communicate to them first with your words like you don't need to fucking be screaming at them and then kind of physically grab them and then push them in their back like it, maybe the physical grabbing on the side of the arms because the person's high or drunk and you feel like you're not getting through some cool but when they turn around and walk away you shouldn't be pushing them in their back especially if you haven't told them hey can you hurry up and like there should be prompts and words said before you escalate to that level it's still not excusable but it should be hey move hurry up get out of here hurry up, uh, uh, and then call i'm gonna push you i'm gonna like warn them or something so they can brace but just push somebody in the back while they're you know probably coming down from just going out doesn't need doesn't need to be even drugs and alcohol just needs to be from going out is exhausting and then you're pushing them and their balance is all off and they go flying and then they dislocate their finger and damage the side one side of their whole entire body and shit like oof like brutal and again it says a lot about the quote-unquote community over there at Berghain. everyone in the queue just looks at them no one wanted to call the police even though the partner should have called the police you shouldn't be waiting for people to call the police especially if your your partner's been splayed on the floor flipping up at, in front of Berghain like that right Me, like i said i would go red and i would literally catch a murder charge out there i'm not having that sort of disrespect done in front of me but come on man no one in the line stepped in to kind of help them out cool lift you know help the person up from the floor assist them on the way home like nothing zero Oof. so much for community in it but yeah hope the person gets better um evolves actually in the next few days i'm not gonna be honest i'm interested to see how it evolves because this is a bit mad but yeah hopefully the person um recovers and gets better because this is a bit mad but interesting to see how they develop it how this evolves and how this gets sorted but honestly, hopefully the person gets better and um, something is done about this um, either way because usually these situations over there tend to kind of get swept under the rug for whatever reason. Uh, maybe they get dealt with personally, but usually something happens uh, aloud and then it gets dealt with in you know, silence behind closed doors and no statements are made and shit. I don't know. Let's see what happens anyway. Let's see what happens. Maybe there's more to the story um, that meets the eye. I'd assume places like Bergen probably have CCTV outside the flipping building or even maybe inside the building. So usually they probably got, you know, some access to the footage of what actually went down. That may actually help to kind of get to the bottom of the issue. But this sounds really, really excessive like the force used um was way way over the top if what has been said in this account is true and a reflection of what actually happened but hey let's wait and see let's wait and see next on the list here to talk about we have to mention this right so um peggy goo has dropped a new single it's called it goes like <laughs> na 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 and i'm only laughing <laughs> because i was shown this my by my fucking girl joyce big up joyce wherever you are and now i can't get this fucking stupid crappy song out of my head and i'm wondering i'm sat here wondering to myself has peggy Goo always had like ghost producers has she maybe fallen off in terms of her production or is my ear just not attuned to her flipping style of music 
or am I just not advanced enough culturally, um, artistically to kind of get what she's doing here? Because this song sounds like pure and utter garbage, especially when you compare it to like Starry Night, especially when you compare it to fucking, you know, Starry Night maybe is a bad example because that might have been like a magnus opus. Every artist is allowed to have one in their career, um, but it should also shouldn't be the one that kind of people use as a barometer to sort of judge your talent. Sometimes you have, you know, the ability to create one just live, timeless track that gets played again and again and again all over the world. But it doesn't mean because you did that, that everything that comes after um, has to match that level. But still, it doesn't even go as far as matching like the remix. I, I was saying to somebody the other day, like, you know, one of my favorite remixes ever is a uh, Peggy Goose remix for um, the song um, At Night by Shakedown. Um, it's an acid remix and it is absolutely phenomenal I, I used to play that out so often it's an absolute slapper um, so it's hard to figure out that that person who made that track made this absolute hot garbage that I guess was debuted in Printworks one time let's play it now so you can hear what this flipping thing sounds like because to me it sounds like hot mess it's on my mind Like, what is that? Like, what is that? That sounds absolutely horrible. And I don't know if it's maybe me that I'm just not attuned to it and it might end up being a summer hit and a summer smash, but I just can't see it. It sounds like the kind of thing that's going to age terribly. Like, you hear that maybe in a couple of weeks, you're going to be so annoyed by it. It's going to be the kind of song that will instantly send you to the fucking bathrooms, to the toilets of a club for a quick bump or a piss or to a smoking area for a cigarette. Even if you don't smoke, just to kind of get away from hearing nah, 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 nah. Like, what the fuck is that, man? But again, a part of me also doesn't want to go too far into it or too deep into it because, I don't know, I just it just feels like Peggy is such a easy target to kind of dunk on because she kind of makes it easy um i guess in some regards and because generally people everyone tends to kind of agree you know maybe she's not the greatest but i think there is a also a little bit hint of genius about the ability to just like i don't know to be who she is basically in life it kind of just makes me think that maybe i've just approached life in general very very differently because the way she's promoting it on her instagram you would legitimately think this this was the hit this was the song this was the one um let's check her instagram stories because i'm sure she's got some stuff on it that i want to quickly comment on here via instagram stories that really made me think like this girl is like really operating on a whole entire different frequency what's she saying here about the, the drama and release date let's hear this what's she saying here morning I'm excited and nervous, I guess. I'm feeling butterflies on my stomach. Do you think, do you guys, do you guys think Peggy Goo's got like a fake deep voice like that woman that got done for fucking the startup? What's it, what's her name called again? What's that lady called that got done? Uh, Feranos, Elizabeth Holmes. Yeah. Do you think Peggy Goo's got an Elizabeth Holmes thing going on where she purposely puts on a deep voice because she knows she has to navigate the fucking treacherous waters of the patriarchy that is <laughs> modern living <laughs> and the flipping, you know, cisgendered um, domination of men within electronic music. So the only way to kind of navigate it is to put on this husky voice. What do you think? But, uh, okay, cool. Let's continue here. For those who ask, basically it was merch giveaway. Um, exclusive. We love the word exclusive. Um, six o'clock somewhere in London. I will have to let you know the location in the last minute. <gasps> oh, she's doing like a scavenger hunt for the track. So, yeah. For those who ask, I'm very happy to be back in London. And it's at six o'clock today in central london you will know okay let's continue more post here i don't know what's happening it, she's this is the lyrics for the song <laughs> it goes like na 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 i can't explain i got a feeling that i just i can't erase it's just a feeling that i won't won't leave behind because it's something that it on it's on my mind i guess it goes like na 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 na
na na na na na <laughs> what the fuck is this shit honestly peggy man what is this shit what are you doing to us like and there's a whole entire promo run around this coming to london birthday cakes streaming the t-shirts and whatever but she's got a very clean tongue though she definitely scrapes her tongue so big up big up peggy on the hygiene there good we'd like to see a good clean tongue um congratulations cake in bed balloons at some fancy hotel cover art flowers from people people sending her flowers or putting out a single like you love that for about her she kind of looks like one of the characters from the flintstones here isn't it with the hair and the glasses and the pearl necklace no she looks like someone from the flintstones i actually thought this was fancy dress but i guess it's not i think this is a vivian westwood top so my apologies if it's not fancy dress but she kind of looks like someone from the flintstones a little bit here She seems happy. And she's got dancers. <sighs> now that, this song is fucking trash, man. I'm sorry. This song is fucking trash. What the fuck is this? Okay, this is her somewhere in... Oh, I guess this is... um Near Tottenham Court Road, isn't it? The park near Tottenham Court Road. That's the thing that's very interesting about Peggy, though. Like... There's not many DJs out there. I think especially female DJs that have so many female fans. Like I keep saying, like one of the things that surprised me at a former workplace I was at, a little startup, there will be girls in there that I'll describe as quote unquote normies. And they were not really into like, you know, uh, dance music, electronic music. But one thing they would always do whenever she would play at fucking Village Underground or anywhere around the Shoreditchy kind of area, maybe even X or Y, I'm not really too sure. But I remember them all buying tickets, like, I don't know, 12 plus girls in this office would all flip and get dressed after work to go and see Peggy Goo fucking DJ. I was like, whoa, that's pretty cool, right? Because usually a lot of female women DJs in flipping the scene usually have a whole fucking army of horny incelly type of guys that are fans of them number one because you know they secretly want to fuck or because they just you know they just like to oogle at them from afar but you don't really see a lot of girls out there seeing them so it's quite cool that she's inspired a whole legion of young women and shit who kind of you know look at her as like a motivation inspiration whatever it may be um, it's quite cool but it's funny also because you know on the other flip side of it she won't spit on any of these guys if they're, if they're, she, if they're on fire do you know what I mean the amount of stories we've all heard about her being a fucking menace behind the scenes is more evident that most likely if, if she had to you know interact with these people in real life they would they probably wouldn't be fans of her <laughs> but it's cool anyway to see regardless look at that security guards and all sorts that she's a fucking Kardashian this is fucking nuts let's, just, let's go back to that video again Fan love, fan love, fan love. So they made a little catwalk thing for the voguing. I love how she's fucking. What's that thing called? I have like I have I, have, I love how she's. Um, what's that word people use when you were fucking still shit from different cultures? I love how she's fucking. I don't know. What is it co-opting? I don't know what the word is. Fucking. I'm losing it right now. But <laughs> I love how she's co-opting queer and gay community for promote this fucking video. Like, I would love to know how many actual gay queer people she's actually friends with in real life. I have a feeling it's not more than five. <laughs> That's my own opinion. But let's see. song is so trash man what's happening here okay people are voguing to the song yeah okay i'm out i'm out no more no more i can't do this anymore so yeah the song is trash but let's hear what she said to um to mix mike it goes as follows the dreamy Balearic inspired track marks her first release on new music in nearly two years combining a bouncy beat poppy melodies and her own vocals and bending guitar style notes to form a surefire summer anthem speaking about the title peggy goo says there's a feeling we all know but it's hard to describe that feeling of love and warmth and excitement when you're surrounded with friends and loved ones and the energy it speaks for itself it's difficult to put into words but to me it <laughs> It goes na 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 na. <laughs> Honestly, I fucking hate it already. The C footage of the recent debut airing at the cut 
um, airing of the cut during the Prince work set, blah, blah, blah. London and the UK have always been a special place for me, she says. It's a city where I discovered my love for music and a place that has always shown me much support. So it was an honour to choose print, to close Print Works and the perfect place to debut the track. Did she, what, was she the last person to ever play at Print Works? Fucking hell. What a result. Peggy, Peggy's busy with a tour throughout the summer with dates across Europe, including her own Pleasure Gardens Festival in London's Finsbury Park in August 6th. Um, a feature showcase of artists on the Goodwood Records. Okay, she got her own festival. Who's playing at her own festival? I've never heard of this shit. It's available on Ticketmaster. That's how you know she's caked up, boy. Peggy must be like Live Nation, WME kind of contact, isn't it, right? She must be on that kind of level. She's got Ticketmaster shit on her stuff. Okay, there's no, yeah, she doesn't even have booking info. There's not even booking info on her bio. That's how big of a person she is. <laughs> booking info does not exist. <laughs> um, Ticketmaster for this Finsbury Park shit is available there, as you can see, or 6th of August. Who is actually playing as well on this? Oh, that's a C. Um, let's see if we can see this. Who's actually playing alongside her at this event, 2023, and line up? Let's see what it says here. Uh, ba 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 ba. Okay, cool. Let's get let's get the image of the fucking fly. Oh no, but it's actually down there on RA. What am I doing? Let's scroll down and see what this says. It's pleasure. Peggy Goo presents Pleasure Gardens in Frisbee Park Sunday, the sixth of August. The lineup features special requests: Mum Dance, Matisse, DMX Crew, Dukwa, and Hiver. Hmm. Not something you'd go overboard to kind of pay for, but I guess it's good because she's promoting people on her label and shit. So that's obviously decent to kind of check out. What are the prices saying for the actual event? 50, 60, 100? Oof, 100. Fucking hell. VIP only available. And a backstage pass is available um, for £151. Fucking hell. She knows what she's doing when it comes to that sort of stuff. But yeah, the track is absolutely dog awful. I don't really mind the artwork, to be honest. I think that's fairly fine. The outfit she wore on a day to, for the release is pretty horrendous. She looks like a character from the Flintstones, but I, feel, I really like the vibe of this outfit. And even the artwork itself looks really good. She's always got really good art direction and stage design and shit. But it's just a shame the fucking music is just so underwhelming, which is surprising. Again, like I said, because Starry Night at home, um remix um there's another one too um what's that one called um it's i think the title is like korean it's like in ingane or something i've got the title track or what it was called but i remember that track being fairly decent so the record the production record is looking a bit spotty so i don't know if this is a uh, evidence that she had ghost producers because the dip has been so you know it's not there's no consistency really it feels like i've crossed her tracks um you know there's one really good one one okay one one mediocre one and the rest of the shit so i don't know if that's evidence of it or if it's just evidence that you know when you're a really successful dj and you're touring all over the place it's hard to make good music because you're always playing you don't have time to be in the studio and shit and craft you know and put together an absolute masterpiece maybe that's the case i don't really know but either way the song is absolutely brutal and um yeah if this becomes a hit i'll be shocked but stranger things have happened stranger things have happened moving on from that one we have to have to have to have to talk about a little bit to do with this regarding a new listening bar opening up in south london called jazu i've spoken about it beforehand on here where i'm actually surprised we don't have more listening bars because it seems like the best option to kind of get around some of our draconian licensing laws um, that don't allow clubs to stay open for a long period of time, gentrification, the local councils favouring the complaints of neighbours or residents, sorry, and not taking into account the business that clubs bring in or reaching some sort of compromise that works for both parties and essentially kind of, you know, curtailing a club's ability to make money and stay open for late, that I think also negatively affects our ability to party well. Because I think, you know, as much as, you know, British people, English people, whatever it may be, have a history of being absolute lager louts and absolute liabilities, I think the way that the licensing laws are set up, the way clubs or even pubs, for instance, have to close, you know, sometimes at 11 p.m., sometimes in some areas, 10 p.m., and then clubs only close at one. So it gives your punters only like two hours to get extra drinking at the end of the day. And then you end up smashing the drinks over your face. And by the time you step out of the club, you're absolutely wasted. And that kind of, you know, can, um, spawn a lot of antisocial behavior especially if you all get chucked out of clubs at the same time which happens a lot but I think if we had a a licensing or opening time similar to what you'd get in cities like Berlin or even Amsterdam it would allow us to have a way more 
um, sensible attitude towards drugs and alcohol. We can kind of balance things a little bit better because we know we don't have to kind of rush out of our house to get to clubs before 12 or 1 or whatever it may be. So listening bars, I feel like, would be a good option to kind of, you know, satisfy everybody's needs because they would allow you to go and go there under the premise it's kind of like a club and not really it's a deeper sort of listening experience you also get to listen to cool electronic music or just cool chill music to hang out to there's probably a decent drinks menu decent cocktails decent beer on tap good little nibbles or an actual pop-up kitchen inside so you can kind of have the best of both worlds you have the environment of a club or the vibe of a club without being in a dark club you get to sit down have some food and listen to some fucking cool music in the process so i'm actually surprised we don't have more listening bars in the uk personally for me across the board um if we're going to have these crazy lessons a lot but again what do i know so the article says as follows newly that's new listening bar jazzu to open up in south london um launching in a co-working space called market peckham tomorrow june 16th jazzu boasts a bespoke sound system crafted by south london audio engineer bosco taylor and upwards of three thousand records amassed by the co-founder resident dj james hannah over the last two decades the lockdown project jazzu began as a three-day pop-up in east london's franz and evans cafe before relocating to south london's corner store in april last year the new space is jazzu's first permanent home we're so excited to open Jazzo again as owners it feels like the first iteration sorry it feels like each iteration we've been able to grow bigger while also becoming more focused we've taken the music to another level to our silent peckham upgrading the fully bespoke sound system these are the big and bad horn loaded speakers of our dreams and we cannot wait to share yeah sounds going to be impeccable in there, isn't it? the only bad thing about these listening bars like you go and chill in them you hear great records on a great sound system and then you pop into your local nightclub and you're like oh uh-huh. Do you know what I mean? It kind of raises your expectation level on what the sound should be. So like when I went to Printworth for the first time, I thought in my head I had an, you know, the idea of like Trezor or like Burkheim or something in my head because of how industrial and kind of big it looks, right? And then you go into it and it's like, oh, is that the sound? anyway it continues um in the run-up to the reopening jimmy found a japanese phrase that we've taken as somewhat of a motto it's called shindu no ichubi which translates as part of the vibration and we had it's itched on the side of a speaker cabinet as a reminder to be part of the vibration oh i love it i love that kind of shit oh look at the interior fucking hell gorgeous um loads of wood loads of browns look at those big horn-like speakers yeah, so it's going to be very warm sounding in there with all the flipping sound waves vibrating off of the wooden shit. A nice little neon Jazzu cocktail logo and whatnot as well going on there. So yeah, eager to see what that looks like going forward, to be fair. Big up them. So it's going to be opening um, by the time you listen to this, it's already open now to check out if need be. Jazzu over there in Peckham. And like I said, I want to see more listening bars, but I also would like to us to just you know modernize our licensing laws get to a point where we can kind of have actual what's that thing called um consultations or whatnot with local you know community leaders or residents and stuff to figure out kind of compromises so you can allow clubs to open up in certain you know densely populated areas but also stay open later so that you don't have everyone coming out at the same time and then causing a ruckus all that sort of stuff could be definitely worked into it but i guess for the time being listening bars will have to do listening bars will have to do moving on from that one i want to quickly mention and talk about a cold wall 2023 pre-4 oh it looks fucking good it looks fucking amazing um it's pretty clear now from the interviews i've been reading about my man samuel ross i've actually got a going to go through one properly um he did a really good interview with financial times and another one with the zine in the lead up to his exhibition that he did which i went to towards the end which was really good um and just in general he's kind of pivot away from being a designer and more into being a contemporary artist which has been amazing to see but it's also been quite a bit of a mindfuck because in my head i guess my own well, how I kind of saw him and how he kind of presented himself to me when I kind of first kind of crossed paths with Samuel Ross was that he was very much kind of going down the Virgil path where he kind of went to build this behemoth of a brand in a Cold War, eventually get to a place where he gets hired by a luxury house to be the creative director and then kind of push it that way, right? But it seems like he actually done the complete opposite. And now he's kind of using 
the kind of notoriety from a cold war to kind of leapfrog and do other things that he kind of always wanted to do like contemporary art like you know making furniture like pushing his own separate creative practice outside of a cold war and now it's got to a point where i feel like a cold war kind of like runs itself he's not even like front and center of it anymore um you you basically see him promoting and pushing a lot of the kind of art stuff that he's doing a lot of the literature in terms of books um just a lot of the his own kind of personal projects you don't really see him front and center you know hand dyeing um garments cutting up stuff and working on stuff ideating it's more so him just focusing on the art stuff and it's been a very casual sorry it's been a casual it's been a very um purposeful and slow transition now you can tell it's something that he definitely did with some sort of intent okay i'm gonna make sure to step back here do this do that do that and now we've got to a point where even if i didn't read those articles it's clear to see from just looking at this that a cold war is just a label that's been able to kind of put out collection after collection without really thinking about the main figurehead anymore you can just look at it just as a label alone and again that's takes a lot of work takes a lot of skill to do that so now they're in a position where the collection just kind of exist um and it's going to grow the way it's going to grow without it being kind of you know the the flipping um calling card of one person which is pretty sick because then you can you know get in loads of people to come and help and contribute to it and add to the overall story maybe tell a different story maybe able to spin a different narrative add different tones and textures or inspiration bloody blah, blah 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 all of it's absolutely amazing all that to say this is fucking hard <laughs> it's really good i looked through it earlier because i got a little alert via the email and it looks absolutely spanking everything in it from the outerwear to the cut on the pants to the shoes like it all looks so 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 good got this amazing reconstructed trench coat um you got this hoodie looks like is that what would you call that is that over dyed is that bleached i don't know what that is where it's kind of got this bronze effect it could probably is bleach um with your cold wool logo on it that looks absolutely brilliant I love the look of that. Clearly, that's going to be a bit of a winner with the kids out there. This look um, also looks flipping fantastic. Great one here with the jacket. This, um, the shysty snood mask thing they have going on as well is really awesome. Um, love the cut on these flipping combat pants. Really not a fan of the elasticated bottom, but I love these shoes. Even the footwear, I think, has been a really clever little thing that he's done with a Cold War, or that Cold War have done it overall, by having these really interesting silhouettes that I guess match um, a lot with what they kind of do in terms of their clothing. Um, and it also is silhouettes that I feel like are a little bit different to what you see out there in the market in terms of shape, in terms of finishing, fixtures, all that good stuff. It all looks really good, like nice and minimal, not much kind of, you know, there's not a lot of kind of panels all over the place. A lot of one piece, I'm sure most of it is functional as well. So that looks really good. Um, got a great hoodie also here with a nice scarf on the inside. Again, some nice footwear. This jacket is harder than hard. This hood design is so cool. So if you're not seeing this, it's essentially a, a what do you call it, like a down jacket with a really amazing kind of finish on the top of the fabric, right? These really big pockets, which I love. One of my kind of go-to sort of interviews I remember or something I kind of hold dear when I kind of remember my choice in jackets is something I remember Rick Owen saying where he said whenever he makes jackets he always thinks about creating a jacket with pockets big enough to fit like a sandwich and a book in it because that's what kind of every person needs if you're wearing a jacket on a day out you need to be able to put a sandwich in there and you to put a book in there if need be and you know a big pocket like this you can fit a couple of books in there a fucking camera do you know what I mean maybe a shank whatever like you can fit all of that in there it looks absolutely great but the best part about it for me is this hood design so it's a zip up that goes quite close to being a full zip but it's got a gap just towards the top where the little where you can basically have your eyes poking out so you have this amazing sort of like t design that kind of kind of i don't know that kind of makes you look like um it's kind of got a little bit like of that kind of gladiator mask sort of style to it um or like the kind of stuff that they used to uh what were they called oh i'm trying to remember what they were called where they were, like, like you're kind of like a knight you got the little slit on the inside that's what it kind of looks like so i really love the design on that one looks really really good um the timberlands look actually quite decent with this i wasn't really a fan of them when i saw them originally they're cold war timberlands but they suit the look really well here um they're essentially you know regular tims that you would know but you know they probably switched the um, finish on them on the upper and then they've made them to be laceless and kind of probably had some elastic or something on the inside or changed basically how they look on the upper so you don't have any laces needed on. so you have the um timberland sort 
sort of silhouette without the laces and all the other wings and you know bells and whistles sorry wings and whistles um this red part this red bomber jacket or just red down jacket is a win for me i'm always a flipping sucker for red bomber jackets um red dove down jacket sorry so this looks absolutely fantastic the pants are probably the winner though in the look um i'm a big fan of combats overall but if you're gonna give me a pair of combat pants with some paneling oof, please god yes and some big pockets on the side there i'm all for it so that's really fantastic the blue the hue on this blue is absolutely gorgeous like wow again that, that's that design with the hood so the hood kind of so the, the, the zip goes just underneath your chin so you have this kind of hole here that's sort of like a diamond design similar to what they probably have on the logo of a cold wall so you kind of have this really amazing little pocket that you can kind of have your head stuck out in the only issue with me with these sort of hoods is that my hair is still too big so it'll still make it kind of stick out so i have to probably get my hair braided to make these sort of jackets work and then the bag also looks really great um this fleece is amazing wow i've just seen this actually this looks really really cool i love the look of that fleece great sort of tote bag we've got a nice little trench again this reconstructed varsity jacket is sensational sensational it's essentially like they've put the varsity jacket through a fucking wood chip machine and then tried to piece it back together it looks so fucking good it kind of looks reconstructed but if you actually look at it there's not much about it that's actually reconstructed it actually just looks like it isn't it it's a really clever little design actually um little details here makes it look like it's been reconstructed but it hasn't I love this man and then you've got the applique with the acw um on the jacket as well that's also going to be a win Ooh, there's so much good stuff in this collection this khaki sort of overcoat vibe is great oh look they've got um wow interesting interesting so what i'm looking at here if i'm not if i'm not mistaken looks like either a cold war version of a nike air mock one of my favorite acgs of all time if I'm not mistaken, the mock was inspired by a fucking potato, the designer that made it. Um, it's essentially like a sock shoe that people would wear to, you know, outdoors and stuff and climbing and shit. It's got no zips or whatever. It's just got like a zip tie to kind of, you know, fasten around your ankle. And I used to love wearing them all the time, especially when I used to go on holiday and whatnot. Um, to sun your climates would be a good sort of like option instead of kind of wearing tether sandals with socks or without socks. Um, you kind of want to protect your feet and not have your feet exposed, but then also have the ability to have something light on um air mocks are definitely or nike mocks are definitely the way to go but sometimes the sole i feel like can be a little bit too low to the ground so maybe this is a bit updated it's got the mock kind of top with maybe a thicker type of sole at the bottom i should actually i'll make you actually see what you see what a nike mock looks like the vintage one because i had a pair i had a kind of nutmeg brown type of option that i used to wear quite often that i unfortunately sold but these basically are what mocks look like and they, I think they look fucking fantastic. One of my favorite shoes, basically, of all time, personally. I absolutely love them. But I'm also a sucker for ACG, so maybe I'm not the best sort of, like, you know, unbiased person out there when it comes to these sort of shoes. But, yeah. Oh, I had these as well. I had these Finsulate ones as well. I had the Finsulate ones. They were fucking brilliant. So, yeah, that's the mock, as you can see there. The Finsulate ones I had also super warm on the inside. Um, and I had also these, this colorway too, this sort of like nutmeg brown color. So, I'm not too sure if that's, like, um a cold wars version of them here or if that's actually just a collab they have coming out but either way i'm excited to see what happens there let's get out that quickly let's push this back boom 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 what else we got here we've got a khaki overcoat another good down coat. i think maybe the same one as a red one but in black um we've got a nice cool hat here going on what nicely designed there we've got a print on the jet on the hoodie you don't really see them do a lot of prints with you know artwork and shit so that's pretty cool uh moving on oh interesting shoes these look like they might be hender schemes are these hender schemes or are these just a cold war's own twist because hender scheme is that label from japan i think that does these really interesting sort of like leather let's see if i can find them hender scheme right they do these kind of interesting kind of flips on shoes that you know but like the designing kind of like this bespoke leather type material um i'm not really sure what the point of these shoes are but i do just remember them being a big thing at a time when i was collecting shoes this was sort of like the final boss if you wanted to hey, get a shoe where essentially like what you see on screen is a quintessential jordan 4 and then kind of done in this sort of like tan um leathery type material i don't really again i don't really know what the point of hender scheme is overall 
but for some reason they do flips on just about every sort of like footwear model out there to be honest let's see you'll show you everything they've got yeah they've got one that they've got an adidas version um they've got one looks like an air force one here at the top they've got one for reebok punk fury they've got an nmd collaboration superstars they've got an air force one type of shoe so they do loads of their own little version they've got a um what looks like a henda scheme margella army sneaker <laughs> look there's one someone made a mock-up of an a yeezy so yeah they got all the kind of options that they do as well so henda scheme an interesting little brand there so that might be the collab there but that look is fucking beautiful isn't it? that looks very much like a ready-made type of vibe there i love that with the olive green and shit that looks really good and then continue again with the nice jacket there and a nice vibe and again back to the start so yeah um a cold war pre-fall 2023 looks fucking fantastic when's it gonna be out um available sec retailers from 16th so today so if you're available and you want that shit definitely go and check it out loads of good stuff in that collection to see and to oogle over do not delay do not blood clot delay moving on from that one we have to talk about this, which I've kind of missed out on talking about and I've kind of waited a bit too long about it, but let's cover it anyway because it's a podcast regarding Edward Inninfor. Um, unfortunately, Uncle Edward has been somewhat ousted um, from British Vogue. Um, he's obviously taken a step down, but you know how fashion stuff is. Usually when people have these sort of jobs, they're usually jobs for life. They're usually amazingly amazing jobs that kind of, you know... Um, for somebody with a passion for fashion, somebody that's been working in the industry for a long time, you usually don't leave these jobs if you don't really have to, or you get kind of pushed into a corner to leave. So most likely it's a combination of many things that probably led to Uncle Edward having to step down from his role as editor at British Vogue. One of the reasons out there could be that he was allegedly gunning for Anna Wintour's role um, overall, right, as the kind of de facto head B-I-T-C-H um, at Vogue overall. And um, to kind of obviously lead and spearhead what you know they're doing over there in Vogue US. But um, Anna Wintour seems to be a very formidable foe. She doesn't relinquish power or control very easily. And we should have known anyway. When the whole George Floyd thing happened, RIP to him, and the unfortunate kind of protest that kind of, you know, subsequent protests that happened also, people got injured and fucked up and shit. And there was a real conversation that was being had about representation, um, about inclusivity, about diversity. And people were really basically putting it on these corporations saying, hey, enough is enough. We want to be included. And some corporations buckled and bent. Some people tried to just kind of put a band aid over it and appease people by putting up black squares and other folk like Anna Wintour didn't budge nothing really changed in the grand scheme of things even when all the Bon Appetit shit happened nothing really changed um so we should have probably knew from then on that Anna Wintour wasn't about to let Edward come in Uncle Edward sorry come in and try to take away any of her flipping prestige or oust her in any meaningful way especially under the guise of diversity and inclusivity she's just not having it in that regard um but it's courtesy of Sky News read the article it says Edward Innerfall stepping down as editor of British Vogue after six years and in full, um, the first and man, man, the first man and black person to do the job revealed the news in an internal memo on Friday. He told staff he was excited to be taking his new role as editorial advisor, British Vogue, and a global creative and culture advisor of Vogue. That sounds like the most like fluffy. Let's give you a let's give you a title so you don't step away completely, and it doesn't look bad on us. There's an optics of us firing the only fucking man and black person ever to fucking spearhead, you know, um, you know, British Vogue. That kind of was what it kind of sounds like. So she's still gonna get a salary, so that's pretty awesome. But it, it it is just kind of to appease and to make sure the optics are right, which is awful, really, to be honest, because it shows how far we still have to go. That this is still a thing happening, especially somebody like a person like uncle edward he's got a cv that's legit from the days of id and all, all sorts of stuff in between styling or whatnot like this is somebody that's been in the industry for a very 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 long time like you know somewhat seen childhood friends with fucking naomi campbell that's how long he's been around and still he's getting treated like this or getting put in a position where he has to quit like this 
Um, Vogue covers are still unique in each country, but instead, content shoots and interviews have been used in multiple magazines in recent years. The 51 year old will report to US Vogue editor Anna Winter, who is also chief content officer of Condé Nast, and who NF4 said part of the decision for him to play a broad role in enhancing Vogue globally. NF4 already oversees Vogue France, Italy, Germany, and Spain. Recruitment for his replacement will begin immediately, but his successor will no longer be editor in chief, carrying the job title of head of content instead. Head of editorial content. That definitely shows a shift in what they're doing over there in Vogue, isn't it? Um, that it's now going to be not editor-in-chief, which is the coveted title. It's going to be head of editorial content. It sounds like a title you'd get working at fucking Vice or BuzzFeed, isn't it? Fucking hell. NN4, who was born in Ghana before immigrating to London, has been praised for his promoting of diversity. Under his leadership, cover stars have included pop stars like Rihanna, environmental campaigner Greta Thunberg, and English footballer Marcus Rashford. So... Let's continue because the actual tea on this is probably the funnest and most interesting part of this whole entire story because it goes to show that sometimes, especially when you're working in places like fashion, you really have to mind your P's and Q's and choose your opponent very carefully because some of these folks who have been in these jobs forever and ever and ever are not letting go, are not dying anytime soon also, not to be macabre or whatnot. Um they you know they're gonna hold on to their job for dear life and if you try to step if you try to what's that what's that term if you if you come for the king you better not miss if you come for the queen in this case you best not miss because if you do miss you're gonna be you know looking around thinking shit where's my job so this is taken from um uh, i think article from time magazine no it's not, i think from the time sorry so big up this person who uploaded it um twitter user called prada maniac oh sorry prada manic check them out on twitter if you want to read the whole thing yourself but this is a screenshot of an article that basically you know uh tells the story from behind the scenes of what actually happened and the kind of you know the house of cars the game of thrones issues that are going on behind the scenes that led to uncle edward deciding to step down from his royal british vogue so let's read this little clip here that they have uploaded so it says when edward ennin for emailed his staff on friday night he put a brave face on it he was stepping down as editor-in-chief of British Vogue, he wrote. Next year, he would be taking a global advisory position at the magazine, which would give him the freedom to take the broader creative projects. The title was nebul nebulous, sorry, but the meaning was clear. The never-ending game of thrones at Vogue House had turned spectacularly against him. His predecessor, Alexander Shulman, had been on the throne for 25 years after only six, ending four was out. Um, it's funny because I think Alexander Shulman must have said something about him as well, so it's really strange. But one thing I really noticed was funny, right? Ran one random time talking about Vogue House. One random time, the headquarters are fucking Vogue and shit in Central London. A random random time, I was cycling around Central when I used to have my twenty six inch BMX. Big up my fucking charge stove wherever you are. Someone stole it, but R.I.P. to you. I miss you every single day. I was cycling around on my charge stove. I was kind of feeling tired, wanting to be posted up, checking you know out the streets, people watching, seeing if I could catch some fucking big booty gals walking down the street and stuff, just enjoying my time in Central London. And I guess by my luck and i had no idea where i was i must have been standing right outside the fucking vogue house and this the open my bike like just chilling and at the same time i was standing there chilling with my bike the fucking fire alarm went off inside so everybody kind of walked out and i remember thinking looking at the building thinking oh shit that's, that's the place where fucking vogue magazine is and then everybody was walking out of the fucking building and the first thing that struck me when i was looking i was like wow a lot of girls and i was like shit there's a lot of white people in there, isn't it? And it was just like white person after white person after white person after white person. Don't get me wrong. This is a few years ago. It's not recently. I'm sure they've done a lot of fucking diversity hires and shit and a lot of kind of, you know, magazine affirmative action. But I just remember just thinking, wow, I didn't know this magazine was so white. Like it was actually surprising to me. Um, and it was also funny because it was like a certain type of white person. Like who's the example I could use? Like um, that Boris Johnson's daughter woman, who I think she does something for Show Studio, I think, or maybe someone else. I don't know what she does, but that that kind of type of person, right? Um, you know, they grow up in a certain area, maybe speak a certain way. Like, but you just know the type of white person I mean. I was like, right, then what? You don't even have white people from ends or from like up north. It's like a particular type of like you know london elite type of person who maybe went to a private school somewhere in switzerland or somewhere here kind of flooding out of vogue house so in that instance if that's the case you know uncle edward did not stand a chance if you're trying to you know go for the top spot with anna winter it continues here 
It says, his appointment in 2017 caused surprise in some quarters and delight in others. The first black gay man to get the job, he had made his name as a stylist working at some of the edgiest and coolest magazines, including ID, one of the best magazines in the world. Even though it's kind of fallen off recently, I fucking still love it. It continues. Arena, um, Uncle Edward was the man Rihanna and Beyonce trusted to make them look good. Beyonce invited him around her house for dinner to discuss ideas for a cover shoot. And when Rihanna appeared on the cover, she did it with her baby son. He met Naomi Campbell when they were both starting out in their teens and she was by his side when we went to the buckingham palace when he went buckingham Paris, sorry 2016 to collect his obe an award of which he's been hugely proud we connect on so many levels she said kate moss was one of the close friends and a-listers who were there last february when he married his partner alec in an orangery at the longleat house which um shant what's that which uh who's Chatelaine. Chatelaine is another close friend. Emma Tyne, the first black marchioness of Bath. It continues. Endo Denifor's watch. Um, Vogue featured a transgender model the first time. And in another first, a man on the cover, the actor Timothy Chamelet. The Duchess of Sussex agreed to guest edit the magazine in her brief time in the UK before Megxit. Um, two years after, her sister-in-law Kate Middleton appeared on the cover. Meghan declined on the grounds that it would look boastful. Instead, her cover featured pictures of women who Meghan considered to be inspirational forces of change. And a mirror that was, Meghan explained, designed to show that you the reader were also a force for change in nf4 recently published a memoir a visible man i actually need to read that in which he charted his journey from being a son of a poor Ghanaian immigrants his mother was a seamstress so he grew up helping her to make clothes um, I knew how to construct outfits, I knew how to sketch, I knew how to costume, he wrote, but I could never imagine it as a career. He was scouted as a model in London underground by a fashion stylist and became assistant to the photographer Nick um, Knight, who'd probably like to be called an image maker or something, right? He like, hates the term photography. <laughs> like, what do you call it? Like image making or fucking, I don't know, something he kind of makes up. But anyway, continue. Um, he spent 20 years as a fashion director at ID. He was hired by Anna Wintour in 2006 to work at American Vogue. From there, he moved sideways to another Condé Nast title, W, before landing in Hanover Square in 2017 as the editor of British Vogue. But this comes, here comes the beauty, the actual juicy parts towards the end here, right? This is the juicy parts of what happened behind the scenes. His takeover from Shawman was bitter. Unpleasant rumours began to circulate that Vogue House was understaffed, uh, overstaffed by posh white girls. See, I told you, right? I told you. When I was there, honestly, I saw fucking scores of them coming out of that fucking place bare made in chelsea type of looking girls anyway it continues when i interviewed a formidable shawman years ago in her immaculate white corner office all i remember of the editorial team was the absolute silence you could have heard a pin drop an exodus of her staff duly ensued when any took over including fashion editor shawman uh, if we're in the fashion editor shawman wrote a piece for the business of fashion website about what makes a great editor and concluded that the somewhat point observation there is not a job for somebody who does doesn't wish to put in the hours and who thinks the main part of the job is being photographed with a series of designers clothes in the roster of famous friends yo that is catty that is fucking catty you know she was sending fucking not so show or not so subtle shots at fucking uncle edward so imagine how much of an uphill task he had. Not only was he trying to oust Anna Wintour, he also had to contest with the person Anna Wintour let go to him to get the job, was also giving him shots on the way out. So crazy. He continues, under NFL Vogue put diversity and inclusion at his heart. Some complained that the readability fell by the wayside with NFL's interest apparently lying more in styling than editing. Advertisers loved it. And although some of his colleagues and employees were soon referring to him as Queen Mother, the Sunday Times reported because of his alleged diva-like behavior. Now for me... One of the things that kind of was a little bit, you know, annoying about um, Uncle Edward's tenure at Vogue was the insistence of diversity. Like everything had to be diversity and inclusion. I personally think he could have done that um, by by default and also concentrating on making it a good magazine, making it actually readable. Um, because he did that, obviously, with the stuff that he did at ID. ID is a good example of it, right? ID has always been a champion of kind of, platforming and promoting the freaks and the weirdos out there but it doesn't do it heavy-handedly it's just part of its dna same thing could be said for like the face and shit so i think he could have done the same thing at british vogue 
without it being so heavy handed and obvious that's my only kind of critique when it comes to that sort of stuff we continue say what you like about Alex Shulman and her posh girls but she managed to keep the office egos in check one fashion insider said under Edward it's been an absolute diva fest fashion PR's report a return of ab fab bad behaviour from staff members jostling for front row seats to tantrums thrown in exotic locations because the many did not comply with esoteric dietary requirements I think that's fucking bullshit whoever's saying this is a fucking hater or most likely doesn't like black people because if you're telling me all of those fucking old white people that are working at fucking vogue house for decades and decades have you know somehow uncle edward and his crew of people had worse egos than them i don't believe it i'm sorry i don't believe it those other people before that he replaced were incredibly entitled they had jobs for fucking life essentially um and they were probably worse than anything i would ever hear about uncle edward i'm not buying that in the slightest that's just like someone trying to besmirch his name for the sake of this narrative anyway it continues there are even rumors that several edin falls wealthy and well-known friends try to get their flights and accommodation sponsored by the fashion brands instead of paying out their own pocket that's not really something to mention that's no point of mentioning it that is just something that happens all the time if you're a celebrity and somebody of note you're gonna try your luck there's a story going around at the moment of some influence. I don't know what, who they are um, exactly, but they are very well known, clearly. And they got invited to a Louis Vuitton show, but they, I think they were in Cannes or somewhere or Monaco. And they requested Louis Vuitton to fly them over there for the show um, in a helicopter. And Louis Vuitton refused, so they didn't go. So that happens often, I'm assuming. Why not? If, you, if they're already giving you an outfit, if they're already paying you a fee, why not just try and chance it and see if they're going to charter a jet for you, book you a fucking helicopter, get you a limo? Why not? Worth a punt. But I don't think that means... That, that shouldn't reflect badly on Uncle Edward, in my opinion. It continues. From the start, there were rumours that the real queen of Condé Nast, Anna Wintour, didn't think Enem4 was qualified for the job for his part Enenfall made no secret of the fact that he coveted hers he viewed British Vogue as a, as a momentary stop on his way to ultimately become editor of US Vogue the most important job in fashion but of course we know that didn't happen it continues here one more little bit here before we leave let me show you here whoops go back to the fucking post um what some more juicy bits here I think we read that da 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 here we go. Here's some other bits here. It says, he did not believe he would have to play the second fiddle for much longer to a 70-something woman, a confident told um, John Aldridge on Sunday Times. He was wrong, <laughs> definitely, because Anna Wintour is not letting go without a fight. Five years ago in 2018, Vogue was forced to deny that there was a growing rift between him and Wintour, with NFL reportedly in tears because Wintour sat next to Queen Elizabeth at the Fashion Week, uh, London Fashion Week, sorry. He made a point of hosting separate British Vogue parties, and when the New York Times asked to interview him with Wintour, he declined. He and Wintour clashed over the editorial um, content of British Vogue, with Wintour putting her foot down when he wanted to make the magazine gender neutral. <laughs> Wintour would say, don't listen to Edward, a virgin I said and he would say don't listen to Anna last September when asked on Vogue's video series 73 questions what she thought she would do be doing with her life if she weren't an editor-in-chief she said conflict negotiation hmm Ultimately, it seems that NN4 may have overplayed his hand. The Mail on Sunday reported yesterday that he threatened to resign last year unless he was given her job. Jesus, that's a bit much, isn't it? Winter retention of the throne was not inevitable. Um, she had apologised in 2020 for the lack of diversity in her staff in a magazine. She, she apologised. Nothing actually changed her. She played that one like a fucking G, to be honest. Um, she gave some people fluffy titles that don't actually mean anything but basically nothing really changed i want to say plainly that i know vogue has not found enough ways to elevate and give space to black editors writers and photographers designers and other creators she wrote in an internal email we have made mistakes to publishing images on stories that have been hurtful and intolerant some black journalists who have worked with anna winter said her apology was a cynical ploy in response to black lives matter protests of course it was um it continues just as either way nuclear um, Winter prevailed, accepting the inevitable. Enin4 attempted to shut down the rumors last year that he wanted her job. Ten CNN point blank, I don't want Anna's job. Pressed on whether he would take the role if offered, he replied, "I would say not right now, not today. I've realized that my strength in my creativity, creating images and contributing to that world, his future at British Vogue, he said, was being worked out. There is still an option." of him obviously there's still a possibility he could take Anna's job in the long term but for now he's definitely been put to one side so that she could do what she does best it looks like um it continues last bit here 
it says Edward shot for the moon and lost a friend told Sunday Times and so will go back to his first love which is being a stylist he has told friends that he can make a lot of more money at, than Condé Nast doing that and has long been frustrated with having to turn down lucrative consultors consultancies because of the perceived conflict of interest which is really stupid isn't it why can't an editor-in-chief of you know of fucking british vogue also do fucking consultancy on the side it's going to one 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 is going to inform the other it's actually going to add to the overall quality of their work they do on the main magazine by keeping those creative juices flowing and shit it's really really stupid they don't let people do that to be fair um whether money will compensate for not getting the job he is so obviously coveted remains to be seen maybe one day he'll stage a comeback and if when winter steps down perhaps when will will take will head in triumph to new york for the time being he goes to the Met Gala. It will be as a guest like anyone else, not the host. With the brands, including Apple, rumored to be lining up for him for a big budget projects, he'll be crying all the way to the bank. So clearly Ed Uncle Edward's going to be fine, but that gives you some background on what's been happening, the kind of Game of Thrones issues, the house of cards, beef behind the scenes, the almost succession-like fucking drama that's been occurring behind the scenes between Uncle Edward and Anna Wintour over there at Vogue. He's now out doing his own ting. Got some roles in there coming probably. And I'm eager to see what he does next because the guy is an absolute talent, um, an absolute icon. And I can't wait to see what he has coming up going forward. So all more power to Uncle Edward. Moving on from this, I want to mention this quickly, right? So I've had my doubts personally about Pharrell Williams' appointment at Louis Vuitton Men's because it kind of came out of the blue. It was also an appointment that was a bit, I felt like a bit of a letdown, especially when you consider all the hullabaloo around um, the replacement or around the person that was going to take um, Virgil's job because he unfortunately passed away. RIP to Virgil Abloh, the GOAT. And there was a lot of talk about kind of, you know, honouring his legacy and continuing on the path that he kind of was going down by hiring somebody black, by hiring somebody that maybe wouldn't have got the opportunity beforehand by just kind of continuing that legacy, continuing that story and kind of serving as a sort of quasi inspiration for people coming up. So a lot of names are thrown out there, the Grace Wells Bonners, the Martin Rose and the like, right? People who are out there who happen to be black but are doing a fucking amazing job um, with their brands and whatnot. So those were some names that are thrown out there that seemed pretty cool. Then out of the blue, fucking, what's his name? Um, robot kid what's the fucking white boy's name that did a few collections I forgot his name but you know the kid I'm talking about he comes out of the blue and he could design some one off collection that he does that's absolutely garbage in my opinion it was sort of like a weird copy of what Virgil would have done but through the lens of whatever brand that he has going on there which was super super strange then you think okay he's gonna get a job so all that's talk about you know giving it to someone black changes then it's this kind of curly head white kid that gets it and he puts out shit collection then you're thinking all oh, underwhelming then out of the blue he doesn't get the job and it goes to pharrell you're like huh pharrell williams like the pharrell williams that i know of kind of growing up and you know coming up a street by the time that he was sort of like you know front and center of the kind of bape you know um renaissance in europe and far beyond was that he was always somebody that was good with like ideas for like capsule collections or one-off projects and items and shit you think about most recently that Montclair padded bulletproof vest type of style thing that he made a while back you think of the stuff he did earlier on with billionaire boys club that was spearheaded a lot by what nigo was doing and skate thing in terms of graphic design um you think of you know just this merch with star trek all that sort of stuff is just like one-off small items small runs you know the stuff he does with his jewelry his bags all custom stuff that makes sense but so far we have never really seen pharrell kind of be able to put together a coherent collection um you know especially one that's like 60 plus looks and more we've just seen him do pretty decent collaborative work so when i see him got a pointer i was like that doesn't make any sense really he's not really a designer in that respect um but then they hired him and then the other bit that's been really interesting has been the fact that he's going to be one of the first shows opening up paris fashion sorry paris um fashion week for men and if you look at the schedule here on the 20th of june 
Louis Vuitton's going to be one of the last shows on the first day of the fucking um, calendar. So there's a lot of pressure on Pharrell to kind of do a good job. And it's been interesting to see because so far, maybe because we've got spoiled with Virgil basically documenting his entire journey before his untimely passing from being somebody screen printing t-shirts to being on the fucking main runway over there in fucking Paris and doing the job at the highest level. So maybe we got spoiled between seeing that because I remember checking his Instagram stories when he went on the first day uh, at work over that Louis Vuitton getting in the lift going in the fucking atelier and studio like it was pretty cool and interesting to see but we don't see that with Pharrell if anything the only thing we've seen with Pharrell so far was his hesitancy or what was that sound I don't know what that was but with the thing we've seen so far with Pharrell was his flipping um you know him being out and being mixy We've seen more pictures of Pharrell being mixy, going to, you know, art gallery exhibitions, as we can see here from the pictures taken from P. Williams World on Instagram. But we haven't really seen any pictures of him in the atelier, designing, you know, I don't know, pinning stuff on fucking mannequin zero. It's just been him being mixy, going to private views, hanging out with Takashi Murakami and looking fucking fly. So I was a bit dubious of thinking, well, this is not going to be good. This is going to be really bad if he hasn't, been doing anything really and just been kind of hanging out this is not looking good for fucking pharrell williams but then if you look closely at some of these pictures of him at takeshi murakami's exhibition here in paris you can see some hints of some up-and-coming things that he might be showing as part of his tenure over there at louis vuitton such as these jeans these monogram style jeans that look like they have a little bit more of a flared um bell bottom style towards the bottom now they could remind me a lot of virgil stuff because virgil did have loved this cut of jeans that he used to do at louis vuitton quite often but there's something about the way he's rocking them especially with these look they look like snowboard-esque moon boots that he has going on there or skate shoes it's giving me a feeling that this might be part of the collection that he might be putting through in a runway and even this little coin purse he has hanging off his jeans that looks like a turtle that's a pretty cool design um with the louis vuitton monogram on it so those all things that were looking like hmm maybe pharrell might actually be able to pull this off by just deciding to like make really cool interesting basics of the stuff that he wears day to day but with a louis vuitton sort of spin um already already applied to it um you see a little bit here as well with this bag that could also be something that he is going to be debuting at his first collection for louis vuitton that looks like you know a classic louis vuitton. i don't know what the style bag is but it maybe added a longer strap maybe there's an inclusion of here like kind of duck shape um leather little hold on the inside also um the hat isn't to do louis vuitton that's human made but this, these, these shoes look like maybe the ones that Virgil did. The pants could also be ones that Virgil did, but they also could be ones for Elder. I'm not too sure, so I'm just gonna, just gonna pontificate on this a little bit. But it's giving me hope. But the thing that definitely gave me the most hope so far has been this recent picture, um, this recent campaign he did with fucking Rihanna as she's pregnant. She's wearing this amazing leather um, Louis Vuitton shirt. It's like an oversized shirt. There's loads of bags and hodls all across her arms in different colors and stuff which is kind of reminding me of mark jacobs at louis vuitton era so maybe that was part of you know the springboard of what pharrell was doing but then also pharrell in front of the picture himself looks absolutely amazing and he's got the same cut of trousers so it's black looks like it could be leather i'm not too sure what the material of it is but you would imagine this is all probably going to be lv so there's a bat there's a motorcycle jacket or an aviator jacket whatever style you want to call it there are these nice mirrored lenses and black pants as well so maybe this is what we're going to see during his collection when he puts it down paris fashion so this is giving me hope that maybe he actually might be able to pull it off he might actually be able to pull it off he might actually defy expectation and then another picture that's giving me hope about pharrell defying expectation is this it's picture of um, Pusha T somewhere in Paris um, on a balcony wearing a leather jacket, um, a varsity jacket by Louis Vuitton with this amazing design on the back. It kind of reminds me of something that you'd see, I don't know, in the kind of Dapper Dan era. So there's maybe a logo they probably ripped this off of, but it looks amazing. It's got Vuitton in the back and essentially it's kind of like a crest, like a sun, like a crest sunrise type of um, design and the Louis Vuitton, the two T's are joined together to make them look like pillars. Like it's a really clever use of design and wording and whatnot. And it looks really great. And I also love the color of the varsity jacket as well, the blend of the white and the black with all the panels and stuff. It kind of reminds me a little bit of a old school Avrex jacket in terms of sort of like how they've, you know, paneled it all up. There's a mix of wool and leather there. And, you know, from Virgil, also oh, from Pharrell's time wearing stuff like, you know, 
um, bait back in the day and knowing how well they did a good varsity jacket this could also be a hint to that sort of era so it's looking kind of encouraging actually I know I had my doubts about it but it's actually looking kind of encouraging because again like I said we haven't seen anything of this guy in the studio or anything and even this jacket actually this M65 that he put together that looks like something he would have done looks absolutely exquisite it's an M65 that's been kind of, you know, upgraded into this lovely plush velvet material that looks like an emerald gold, or sorry, emerald green with um, Louis Vuitton logos kind of plastered all over them, embroidered in the yellow. And then on the collar, it's got this amazing like white plush mink type of fur on the inside. It's going to look incredible. But he's taken a classic, you know, streetwear, menswear item with the M65 and upgraded it in terms of the materials and the finish you'd get at Louis Vuitton. So maybe these in indications, maybe these are indications that it's all going to be okay. And I've got nothing to worry about um, because at first I thought Pharrell was going to be a bit of a dud at Louis Vuitton, but this could be um, an example that maybe things are going to be okay. So we have to wait and wait and see what happens, but the show is due to be soon. As you can see here, it's happening on June the 20th and um, the last show of the day, 8.30 PM Louis Vuitton men's Pharrell's debut over there. You get to see what it's going to be like and what he's going to be putting together on the runway but for sure this kind of explains why they would hire him because you'd imagine maybe LVMH would have had a hard time getting Rihanna to star in the flipping Louis Vuitton campaign but because she probably has a personal relationship with Pharrell and shit she decides to do it so this is maybe part of the reason why they hire people like Pharrell instead of actually hiring trained and um, designers that have gone to school and shit and have got their own brand because of the star power and their ability to turn the runway into a festival right into a proper red carpet type of event so maybe that kind of adds to the whole luster of it especially when you think you know Louis Vuitton especially as a, a brand itself most of their money comes from bags anyway so the collections and clothes and stuff is kind of like a free run to do whatever you want um, because most of the money like I said is made with the bag so let's wait and see um, June 20th to see what he does and what the collection looks like over there in Paris Fashion Week um, the first day features what what brands do you have here you have um, FM Bachelor Arts you have Velvet Studios you have Kidil you have Burke Aikloy, you have Georges Windle, Etudes, and you also have Louis Vuitton. So let's see what happens there. First day of Paris Fashion Week is going to be for all day. I'm eager to see what he does and what he puts on that runway. Anyway, that has been the Exxon Zing Show, episode number 683. Thanks again for tuning in. Pleasure, 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 pleasure to have your company as per usual. If you've enjoyed the show, please make sure you smash the like button down below for me. That will be greatly appreciate if you're watching the stream or if you're watching the rerun so on youtube if you're listening to the podcast um now then i do would encourage you to leave me a five-star review if you can and um, but if you're listening to this also you would hear my cheer of the day playing underneath my voice as per usual but yeah thank you for tuning in been a pleasure to have your company and i'll see all of you guys again very very soon take care for now be safe peace